Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study. Our book of Isaiah, Yahweh's Savior, or the salvation of Yahweh, how that being the meaning of the name Isaiah. How precious the Father's word. Here he's giving warning about if you don't follow him, you end up in trouble always. Now that, that happens back in as much as God is the same yesterday, he is today, and he is forever. That's the way it is, friend. If you follow him and you do your best to obey, you're still going to fall short. But if you do your best, he's going to bless you. But if you go against him and you leave him out of the equation of your life, you're in a heap of hurt. And he described the nation as, as uh, people gone bad in the last lecture. And we're going to pick it up, even though in the middle of that chapter he said, but if you do what's right, you'll be blessed. Well, he picks it up with a little different group of women today in chapter 4, verse 1. Let's pick it up there, if we may, uh, with the word of wisdom from our Father. And verse 1, chapter 4 of the book of Isaiah reads, And in that day seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel, only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. Now, a lot of people try to tie this, teachers try to tie this to the, that it's going to get so bad that these women will try anything. Now, this is a, when it says seven, you should perk up. You should know the 7,000 that are God's elect. You should know that those 7,000 were wed in the first earth age. There is wife, okay. Why? Because as it's written in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, I chose you before the foundations of the world. Knew you then, chose you, in your mind. So, um, and why do they want to be called by his name Christ? They're Christians. And being a Christian, it saves you from the reproach of heathenism. And how precious that is uh, to simply carry his name. And, and, and in that day, what day are we talking about? Well, the last days. That's how it goes. When God calls that wife back again. And in Revelation chapter 19, when it comes to the marriage, he already has one wife and then the bride. Okay. Interesting. But you've got to go all the way back to the first earth age to truly, truly understand that because he has this uh, wh what is her bread why can she say I will have our own bread his body it's the bread of life and what about this apparel the gospel armor those 7,000 which are called God's elect that means seven means spiritual completeness in numerics that number that is perfect that was chosen in the first earth age that that um, partake of that bread of life, knowing that through that body took the beating, we get the healing. And the apparel, the gospel armor, on and in place to stand against the fiery darts of Satan when he comes as Antichrist. Um, and he does take away our approach. Because if you follow him, you're blessed. Verse 2, In that day shall the branch, that's to say Messiah, of the Lord be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely, uh, beautiful, for them that are escaped of Israel. Ezekiel chapter 33, verse, um, uh, along about verse 22 uh, and 21, tells you about these that escape from Israel. What does it mean? From, uh, from uh, it means those that escape the trials of temptation because why? They know who the Antichrist is. They do not find him tempting at all. Thus, by not finding him tempting, they escape the hour of temptation because they're God's soldiers. They're those that go by his name, carry his name, have his gospel armor on and in place, partake of his body or his many-membered body, and um, it is beautiful. That's what, it, that's what you have in serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Even in these perilous, troublesome times, 
verse 3. And it shall come to pass, not maybe, it shall come to pass, that he that is left in Zion and he that remaineth in Jerusalem shall be called holy. That's all that's going to be left. Holy. Even everyone that is written among the living in Jerusalem. Hey, if you're not written among the living, what, what are we talking about? The book of life. And living means we're not, not just talking about living in the flesh. We're talking about living eternally, living forever and ever and ever. Um, everyone that will be left there after the second advent, every, why? On the first day of the millennium, that's the Lord's day. That's what we're talking about. Every knee shall bow to him. It'll kind of go downhill after that by those that um, can be led astray. But uh, for that time, it will all be holy. And, and what is written is written. There's a separation coming as well. You know that. Verse 4. When the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. Do you know what that burning is? You'll find that burning written in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. At that very moment where you're told in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that don't be deceived about our gathering back to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not going to happen until after in verse 3, the, the son of perdition be revealed. And the son of perdition is the devil, as Antichrist. But in verse 8, this is the burning. And then, after the Antichrist stands in Jerusalem claiming to be God, as it's written in verse 4 of the second chapter of Second Thessalonians, then the, the uh, eighth verse comes into being. And then shall the wicked be revealed, identified, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. The brightness of his coming is the burning fire that um, brings everything to order. And that fire will, as the Holy Spirit, will either comfort you or burn you. It's according to what's written by your name in that living book. It doesn't, you know, I don't want to offend anyone, but it doesn't make any difference where your letter is here on earth, basically. Because your letter is kept in heaven. Almighty God keeps your letter. It's in the book. Your name is in the book. Good, bad, or ugly is right there. And what you have done is written by it. Everything you repent, it's erased. The good remains. How precious he is. But our Father shall destroy that that goes against him. That's why it's ever so important to love him, follow him, and be blessed by him. Verse 5. And the Lord will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion and upon her assemblies a cloud of smoke by day that, that is a, a shadow to keep you from being too warm. And the shining of a flaming fire by night to keep the temperature nice. For upon all the glory shall be a defense. And, and this uh, defense in the Hebrew is a canopy. Do you know what kind of canopy is? It's a wedding canopy. Because a wedding is about to take place. Um, and that canopy protects. God loves his children. He will always protect you. He will always care for you, whether it's night, day, or somewhere in between, as long as you stay in his word. And, and uh, at the same time, absorbing the word, you become wiser than the serpent. And any of his people knowing how to protect yourself and your family. Verse 6. And there shall be a tabernacle, that's the canopy, okay, for a shadow in the daytime from the heat and for a place of refuge and for a, co a covert from a storm and for, from rain. In other words, um, 
he takes care of his own. Always has and he always will. He's a protector. And when, when you rest yourself as the great song of Moses, which is, has to do with God's elect, this seven that are God's elect, however that number is, whether it's the remnant, the kings and queens of the ethnos, those that love him and follow him, <clears throat> or under the wing of that great eagle, which is our father, and he protects us. Don't, uh, God makes it very clear. He even says to Satan in Revelation chapter 9, verse 4, don't try to touch my children that have the seal of the living God in their forehead. Or he says in another place, touch not mine anointed. He takes care of his own. And you would tremble. You don't have to. He that created all things, he that is all things, loves you when you're following him. And he has that canopy of protection and of longevity that you can dwell in. It's called the house of God. And wherever he is, that's where that house is. He is the temple thereof, as it is written in Revelation chapter 21. Okay, we come to chapter 5. <clears throat> the first part of this is the parable of the vineyard. And the parable of the vineyard comes from this, based on it. God had a vineyard. He fixed it up all nice, turned it out to husbandmen, and it went bad. And uh, he goes into a little bit of the detail. Let's go for it. Chapter 5, verse 1, and it reads, Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard, in a very fruitful hill. Uh, this um, this um, fruitful hill is the horn of, of the son of oil. Okay? That, that says a lot to the scholar of God's word. Okay? The anointed one and the anointing. The anointing oil in the very vineyard. Okay? You want to remember as, um, as it is written in Luke chapter 20 the, uh, who this vineyard is is it's uh, the branch is Christ and when you're on that branch God does the pruning if you're not producing fruit whack he cuts it off okay so uh, the parable of this vineyard goes on and on throughout the word of God but here we have the base let's go with it verse 2 and he fenced it that's what you should do okay and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine. I mean, nothing but the best here. Okay. I mean, when you plant the best, when you have cultivated that ground as it should be cultivated, cared for it, and put a fence around it where the little foxes can't bother it, Kenites, should be well, should be okay. And he built a tower in the midst of it. That's a watchtower to keep the enemy away. And also made a wine press therein. I mean, the harvest is ready. All you got to do, plunk them in that wine press. The, uh, the uh, grape juice runs off the wine. The ayun is made, and boy, the harvest is ripe. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes. And it brought forth wild grapes. Now, wild grapes doesn't really catch this, okay? It's, it's considerably, uh, and the true translation would be considerably uh, uh, worse. The Hebrew word is bioshem, bioshem. And it, it, it means poisonous berries. And, but but it's, it's even more than poison berries. When you go to the prime, it's stinking poison berries that stink. And then you can go to um, the 24th verse of the last chapter when he would say, and it shall come to pass that instead of a sweet smell, there shall be stink. And so it is. Now, um, I, it's difficult to mix fruits, but at the same time, because of, of uh, biosham, poisonous berries, 
you can't help as a student of God's word remembering the tares of Matthew chapter 13 for the very simple reason when you plant tares it looks exactly like wheat the blade you know difficult very difficult to tell the difference between zuan is the technical name for the plant and wheat and as it grows both beautiful beautiful uh, uh, plants but then when the tares produce fruit it's black and it's poisonous so kind of put two and two together here about God's vineyard you know when you, there's so much to this that I don't want you to read over it okay when you plant the very best of the crop I mean you, you've got um, the choicest vine set out here. It shouldn't go bad. You should have gotten the choicest of grapes. It shows you how people let God down. He put everything he had into it. I mean, broke it to ground, planted it, put a fence around it, put a watchtower out there and then turned it over to somebody and look what happened. Somebody came in and, and um, intermixed the grapes, the vine. Verse 3. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. You take um, um, my truth... And this word, what is the truth and what is the word? Verse 4, what could have been done more to my vineyard? What could I have done that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes, uh, bioshem, poisonous, bitter fruit. You know, our Father has all the patience in the world. And he's saying, where did I go wrong? Well, the answer is he didn't go wrong. The attendance of the garden, the vineyard, went wrong. That's why you want to do what's right, beloved. Everyone makes a difference. Every heart that loves him, that follows him, makes a big difference to his vineyard. See that you always remember that. Verse 5. And, and, um, and now go to, or what am I going to do? I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof. I'm going to take away that fence. And it shall be eaten up and break down the wall thereof. And it shall be trodden down. And so it is with the... Uh, Jerusalem, when the Antichrist comes, he's, he's going to pull everything out. He's going to let the Antichrist take over. Uh, that's what it has reference to. You're taught that in the New Testament over and over, as well as you're taught in the book of Daniel exactly how it goes down. Verse 6, And I will lay it waste, it shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns, I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. In other words, the rain and the latter rain is truth. There's no truth going to hit Jerusalem. There's no truth going to hit people that won't dig it from the letter God sent when he pruned and planted and plowed and wrote. Have you read it? Verse 7, For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, getting down. And the men of Judah, his pleasant plant. You got it? Now don't read over this. And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression for righteousness, but behold a cry. I mean, that's all we could hear. Okay. Um, what, uh, I mean, he did his best. He put it there. He gave them you know, you don't don't forget Jerusalem is God's most favorite spot in the universe, Mount Zion. 
That's why he calls it his vineyard especially. He made an everlasting living covenant with this geographical location in Ezekiel chapter 16. The eternal heaven will be set up in this place right here on earth. It's easy to read. It's documented in Revelation chapter 21. Heaven is wherever God is. Now we're going to have six woes that follow. And they're woes that are very fitting even of this time. The first woe is covetousness. The second woe will be desolation. The third woe will be excess, like too much liquor. And the, the fourth will be captivity. Iniquity will be the fifth. And destruction will be the sixth. So let's get into the woes. Verse 8. Woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field, till there be no place that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. In other words, when, when you crowd anything up, it can get diseased real easy, and disease spreads real easy. Example, you, you apples keep pretty good. You know, when you spread them out, they'll keep a long, long time. But you take them and put them in a barrel and have one rotten apple in it, and it'll rotten the whole apple, a barrel of apples. And when you crowd people up, you're going to have crime, rape. You're going to have the whole bundle. And man was created to enjoy the earth. You never, you'd never see a herd of deer. You'd, you'd never hear the quail at night as they whistle, Bob, wait. You wouldn't see the turtle doves as they feed or the whippoorwill. You couldn't, you know, you miss seeing the geese fly over both ways in the seasons of the world. What all, and, I, and I'm not saying this sometimes it's too late and people are joined house on the house. But you can even change that. I don't care how close your neighbors are. If you'll do your neighbor as you want to be done, you'll get by pretty good. But God made it clear. Anytime you crowd yourself up too much, you're looking for trouble. Okay, it's going to happen. Uh, verse 9, to continue. In mine ears, saith the Lord of hosts, of a truth, many houses shall be desolate even great and fair, without inhabitant. There's going to be foreclosure after foreclosure after foreclosure. They're going to be empty. Ten. Yea, ten acres of vineyard shall yield one bath. You're going, to, you're going to get about six gallons or a gallon. And the seed of a, an homer, you plant ten bushels and you're going to yield uh, back an ephah, which is about three pecks. That's bad, friend. That's real bad. Plant ten bushels and get back three pecks. That's what happens when you put stuff. You never when when you go to a horse race, don't bet on a dead horse. Okay. I mean, you're losing coming out the gate, and don't bet on people that are spiritually dead to lead you. Okay. Listen to your father. He's giving you some good advice. You may have to have a little bit of a little knowledge concerning horticulture to keep up with this, but it's a fact. <clears throat> with taxation, usury, and so forth, it amplifies. It takes away, and it's pure legal robbery. Verse 11, next woe coming, okay? Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that continue until night, till wine inflame them. Now, in, in the great book of Timothy, it says, uh, you know, uh, if you're uh, concerned and your business is bringing you down, take a little wine for the good of your stomach. Uh, the difference between... Uh, Strong drink, it means too much, a tub of it, okay. not a little for, the, for health's sake, but just on and on and on until it takes you over. Alcoholism. That's why desolation and alcoholism and 
drugs will put you in desolation. 12, and the harp and the vial, the tabret, the pipe and wine are in their feast. But they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of his hands. They don't have the foggiest of what's going on or they wouldn't do that. They would much prefer to be in the spirit, which is the Holy Spirit, rather than spirits from the bottle. Okay. 13. Therefore, my people are gone into captivity. The capt captive to what? Strong drink, drugs, because they have no knowledge. And their honorable men are famished, and their multitude dried up with thirst. Thirst for what? Thirst for the truth a famine for the truth, to, to lead people, guide people. Remember in the last two lectures back, he said, I'm going to put your rulers as the, with the minds of little children, childish, wimpish leaders. We've got them. You don't have to sit around very long to figure that one out. Verse 14 Therefore, hell, or translated the grave, you can read it hell if you want to, but it's grave. Therefore, the grave had enlarged herself and opened her mouth. I mean, instead of just being three by, by six, it's way on out there to five by ten, where you can fall in it easier. Got it? That's the point. Opened her mouth without measure and their glory and their multitude and their pomp, and he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. What? The grave. You fall into it. He said, I'm going to make it easier for him to die, to find the grave. If you don't obey him, that's what will happen. And, and how, what, what a lonesome, destructive trip it is. What desolation. Do you understand why we call this the woe of desolation? Because your family will desert you. When, when you begin to think so much of yourself that all you can think of is strong drink, to isolate yourself away from your family, you'll lose your family. You'll lose your home. You'll be destitute. That's what he's talking about. And that old grave, he said, it just keeps crumbling over and the mouth of it gets bigger and bigger until you're going to stumble and fall into it a lot easier. Well, wouldn't God be concerned? No, he's warning. Of course he's concerned. <clears throat> 15. And the mean man shall be brought down. And the mighty man shall be humbled. And the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. It's coming. 16, but the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judge, shall be exalted in judgment, and God that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. No other way. And would you want it any other way? What that means is that he's always right. The truth that he's giving you here is exactly how it goes down. Well, how can I believe that? Well, look around your cities today. We just said there's foreclosures. The houses are empty. What's happening, friend? And when you see um, uh, police departments that are worked overtime because of druggies and drunks, this is why that I highly recommend the AA. And, and, you know, some people will give a cop out. Well, hey, they, they don't have the same religion I have. It's not a religious organization. It's an organization to dry out drunks, not to get religion. They have steps, and they always look to a higher power, but it's so that all peoples, regardless of what, can fit in. So don't, don't go there to get religion. Go there to not be a drunk anymore. That's what you go for. And until you make your own mind up that you want what is righteousness, that you want to be sanctified in righteousness of Almighty God, that you want assistance and you want help, you cry out to Him. Ask His help and seek help if you can't do it any other way. There are people there that can help you. You can't con them. 
Why? Because they were alcoholics themselves, and they know when an alcoholic tries to con somebody to get another sip. I highly recommend it if, if uh, nothing else has worked for you. Verse 17, Then shall the lambs feed after their manner, and the waste places of the fat one shall strangers eat. If you know you don't take care of business, guess what happens? That's a woe, all right, and it's a bad one. Now we come to the next woe. Woe, verse 18, woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin as it were with a cart rope. In other words, you sin so bad that you can't carry it all. You've got to have a rope tied to you and you're pulling a cartload of sin along behind you. Th that's bad, friend. That that's an habitual sinner. You've got to cut those ropes loose from yourself. Get rid of those things. Get rid of that sin. Serve Him. Let Him know that you love Him. That's, that's a woe that you want to have nothing to do with, okay? It's um, a woe of, um, I mean, being really bogged down in sin. 19. They say... Let him make speed and hasten his work that we may see it. If you've got a God, let, he, let us see him. And let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw nigh and come that we may know it. In other words, show us what your God's got. They're going to find out all right. That's what these woes are about, is that you would see and know and understand that uh, God's telling you exactly how it's going to be. Hey, listen, so far in these woes, you can look around you today, and if you can't see it, you're a blind person. You're kidding yourself. When you look at the house on the house and look at the economy and what's happening and look at the, a, a, a lot of the people in this country that have basically lost it because of drugs or alcohol or losing their families, there's no need in it. God planted this earth whereby you can make it if you'll just listen to Him. Don't miss the next lecture when we finish all six of these woes. They're very, very helpful to you to know, see, and understand, and see the death. Okay, listen a moment, won't you please? The Strong's Exhaustive Concordance